Ah. Okay, good afternoon, everyone. And you are only welcome to uh, open dialogue with the theme, the role of open knowledge. In Okay, good Hi everyone, um, Christabel is having some challenges, so I'll take over from here till she joins us. So um, like she was saying, the reason for us being here is that we are commemorating the World Development Day 2022. And then uh, we are discussing the role of open knowledge in global environmental change in a digital era. So we are, we are privy to be blessed with four speakers. Um, I think for now we have about two, so we'll wait for um, the two more than we we'll officially begin. But before the others begin, I mean, the others join us, I would want to introduce the speakers that are already here. So I have here in the person of Mr. Daniel Abudri Anoriga. Um, he's a journalist, and then he's also um, an environmentalist as well. So. Mr. Anorega, if you would want to introduce yourself quickly. Yes, good afternoon. Um, so as he rightly mentioned, I am Daniela bukran um, a journalist and um, a Wikipedian and co-founder of the Guruni Wikimedia community, an indigenous community and part of the Wikimedia Foundation. Then, um, as an environmentalist, I worked in the green space or in the environmental climate change space for about six years now, and that has been so far. My work has spanned through these three uh, things that I mentioned in the area of journalism and as a Wikipedian, and then as an environmentalist. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Norega. And then the second person is. Mr. Otoe Chang from Kwache. So if you can hear me, Mr. Otoe Chang, you can kindly introduce yourself. Thank you very much. Um, as Elia said, my name is Mr. Otoe Chang from Kwache. I'm the president and founder of Eco Warriors Movement. I'm an environmental research scientist, a climate advocate, and an environmentalist myself. So I've been in this space for I think since 2012, I've been in this space and I've been doing more work with research and Pareka so far as environmental sustainability is concerned. And I'm happy to share whatever I have. I'm also a Wikipedian, so I make good use of the open movement and open knowledge as well. Thank you. Um, Eugene, I think you are muted. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Thank you so much, um, Soto. So I'd also want to introduce our third speaker. She's in the person of Mrs. Ruby Damashi Brown, and she's speaking uh, from the Wikimedia Foundation. So um, Ruby, if you can kindly introduce yourself. Okay, thank you so much, Eugene. My name is Ruby Damashi Brown from Ghana, and I'm currently a fellow at the Wikimedia Foundation. Proud to that, I have been a programs manager at Open Foundation West Africa, where we organize a lot of campaigns within the Wikimedia movement. So I'm happy to be here to share some knowledge and insights on the topic. Yeah, thank you. Okay, thank you so much, um, Ruby. So to begin with, I think um, Christabel is ready now. So I'll just hand over to her then to proceed with the dialogue. Thank you. 
Okay, thank you very much, Eugene. Thank you very much, everyone, for making it a point to join us in our open dialogue today. As rightly said, the theme for today's discussion has to do with the role of open knowledge when it comes to environmental change, especially in the digital era. So we are going to have um, a nice moment where uh, we are going to take opinions and views from our speakers as to how we can use open knowledge to help promote or create the awareness of the environmental um, crisis we are having and the solutions that can be put in place to help us have a healthy planet as the hashtag goes only one earth. So yeah, we'll, we'll take a short um, statement from Emmanuel Amayal, if he's here, yes, he's from Youth Climate Council Ghana to give us a short statement on why we are here. Thank you. Yeah, hello, everyone. Um, good afternoon. Uh, it's good to be here. My name is Emmanuel, as she rightly stated. I'm the Communications and Outreach Officer for the Youth Climate Council, and I'm also privileged to be a speaker for this event. Um, we are the Youth Climate Council uh, acknowledge the importance of public education on climate change. And so we are happy and excited to, to partner with the Open Foundation West Africa and the Wikimedia Foundation in creating awareness on climate change. Um, Afrobarometer uh, points out that uh, climate awareness is pegged at 44, about 44% essentially of Ghanaians have never heard of climate change. They don't know what it is about. And so um, an open dialogue like this is very important in, in the right as an, in the step in the right direction. And so as we join, we hope that we'll have a very fruitful event. And we'll, I wish us all the best in today's event. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you um, so much. I would want to pass a quick statement. I'd want to state that the dialogue here is um, facilitated by the friendly space policy. So we are saying that if anyone has any question or wants to uh, contribute during this dialogue, kindly raise your hand so that we would give you the opportunity to uh, speak. And we don't want to have any interruptions when any of our speakers are um, presenting. And then I would also want to states that if there are um, any challenges with you and muting your microphone, that is because we have muted everyone to allow the speakers to um, present. So right after their presentation, we'll open the floor for questions and suggestions. Thank you, everyone. Okay, thank you. Um, so as I said, this session is going to be fun because we are going to have um, insightful views coming from our various speakers. So without wasting much time, I'd like to engage our speakers um, as to whoever is ready, as to the fact that you are called upon in, in your various capacities as either climate um, change activist or a Wikimedian promoting climate change or promoting um, environmental issues in within your space, we are calling on you or we've called on you actually to come and tell us how you think we can all come together in promoting a healthy environment for ourselves. So I would like to use this opportunity to take a um, short statement on the expectations of our speakers today on what people should know at the end of the session. So I'll start with Ruby. Ruby, what do, what do you expect at the end of the session? Okay, thank you so much, Christabel. I think this is a very um, great opportunity for people to learn what open knowledge is and how important it is in our world today, especially in promoting um, environmental change. So this is what I'm expecting that people get insight about what open um, knowledge is, the kind of open knowledge platforms that we have that they can leverage on and why it's important, yes. Okay, thank you very much. So um, we are joined here also by Mr. Maxwell Beganin. 
He is um, a training associate of Open Foundation West Africa and also a climate change activist. So Mr. Maxwell, since you are here, you have the floor to tell us what you expect at the end of the session. Okay, so thank you very much, Christabel. And then thank you very much also, Ruby. Can you all hear me? Perfect, perfect. So um, yeah, my name is Maxwell, just as um, Christabel has uh, mentioned, and I'm really excited to be part of this conversation because um, it, it, it tells us that uh, knowledge is very important. And some of us who work within the knowledge management, seeing a lot more people um, getting excited and then wanting to know more about how knowledge or the development of knowledge um, helps in uh, mitigating some of uh, the issues of all the issues of um, climate change. So what I expect that we all would learn after the event is or would take away is to leverage on the existing um, tools and then be innovative and the innovative ways of uh, um, solving the issues of climate change. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much, Maxwell. So, Otto, if you are there, you have the floor to also tell us what your expectations are at the end of today's session. Thank you. So, what I'm looking at is, um, at the end of the day, we'll be able to create the maximum awareness needed and to be able to get start in young people the willingness to start an environmental action. And for that matter, to put in place measures to address the triple planetary crisis. So I'm believing that by the end of the day, our listeners will be exposed, one, they'll be informed, two, and they'll be ready to start an action. Thank you. Okay, so just as the UN has globally called us to a collective and um, transform transformative, yes, <laughs> um, as to come up with urgent actions in curbing the environmental crisis. Let's see what or hear from Daniel Anyorga, who is actually a journalist, as to what he expects at the end of the session. All right, and um, so expectations. At the end of the day, we should get to understand uh, the role of the media in protecting the environment. And then the second bit will also look at how the media is using open knowledge to conserve the environment. Then the last bit is to provide the audience the opportunity to ask questions concerning the role of the media in shaping perception and even creating an eco-conscious society so that we are all at the same page because the media is, isn't only about the, the mainstream media. The media is, is broad and there's so many sectors that young people or, or the population can leverage on. So at the end of the day, yes, these three things should be ticked and marked as done, yeah. Okay, thank you very much. I believe um, Emmanuel Yabwa has already given us a bit of what he expects or that was an opening statement. Emmanuel Yabwa. Hey, sorry, Emmanuel Ameya. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the name is Emmanuel Ame. I'm not here, but, but again, thank you. I think that this event is important, and I I hope that my expectation is simple. I, I am expecting that after this uh, dialogue, we will spark a conscious uh, youth uh, movement, and people will be able to ask the right questions when it comes to our environment, and also people would be able to create the needed awareness, uh, especially on social media and other platforms that young people have access to. So for me, uh, it's it's. It's good. I'm excited and yeah, ready to uh, share my perspective on, on the issue. Okay, so I believe we are all excited to actually be on this platform. So as I stated earlier, there has been a global call. This is in commemoration with the World Environment Day celebration. And we are called to uh, for a collective transformative action on a global scale to celebrate, protect, and restore the planet. So yes, we are actually going to have very important discussions. I mean, very sensitive ones because day in, day out after 1972, since this celebration was established by, at the UN conference, um, it seems that many leaders have actually come up or have agreed 
to help protect the environment. But to date, what do we see? We see lots and lots of crisis coming up and it's like we are stealing from, from the future generation. So there is going to be deliberations on, in these areas and we hope that um, our various speakers will come up and tell us what we need to know because the theme has to do with the role of open knowledge. So the knowledge they have, they are going to make it known to us without us paying anyways, <laughs> it's going to be free. So that we, the listeners or the audience will take it out there as um, our speakers have said, to increase the awareness in carbon uh, environmental crisis in our planet. So my first question, which we can all deliberate on as to you telling me from your point of view what you think the environment is and what are the the pressing problems facing our environment so yes ruby actually happens to be the only female here so as the saying goes ladies first so she's going to tell us what the environment is and what she thinks is the the most pressing problem facing our environment today ruby yeah, thank you so much, um, Christopher, for this question. I mean, we all know what the environment is. I'm not coming to give any um, lectures here, but the environment is where we find ourselves, where you and I, wherever that you find yourself, su your surrounding is basically your environment. And so um, right now we've seen a lot of um, crises that are happening in our world. And even with the recent rainfalls that we are seeing, we've seen a lot of crises that are happening with regards to flooding. And people who do not have to die are dying just because of flooding and poor drainage. So these are some of the issues that are facing our environment today that we need to talk about and make sure that the right measures or the right adaptation um, measures are put in place so that people don't have to lose their life because of a flood. Thank you, I'll leave it for others. I think there are a lot of people on the panel who are also expert on the topic. So I'll leave it for others to also share their thoughts. So, so yeah, Matzo, well, what, what's All right, view? so, um, okay, so my view, it's uh, just as uh, Ruby um, said, if you look at um, the environment or what constitutes the environment. I mean, we all know from maybe the basic knowledge that whatever surrounds us is the environment. And it's very key to uh, first have that as a, a backdrop information or the operational understanding of what the environment is. <clears throat> now talking about the issues of, um, uh, the, the issues that we find around, um, it is well crafted within the tri uh, triple plenary crisis, which is um, pollution, um, biodiversity loss, and then climate change. You look at these three as the uh, fundamental blocks of um, how our environments are being polluted. I'll just, I'll just cite one example. So if you look at um, our context, for example, you realize plastic pollution is one of the things that we are really battling with. Um, just as I said, pollution is just a block of, of, of the triple um, plenary crisis. So we have plastic pollution, we have air pollution. Uh, th there's so much pollution that is going on. But for our context, I think um, plastic is one of the problems that we have here. Uh, when you buy water, it's plastic. I, I, I'll throw this challenge to us. You can sit down and actually find out if you can go a day without plastics. When you buy food, it's plastics. When you buy water, it's plastic. When you buy, so at the end of the day, what is the end? Uh, uh, where, where are these plastics ending? You realize that they go into our choke gutters, causing uh, as part of, um, 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 or it, it serves also as a way that increases the flooding issues, causing that kind of ripple effect. So it's just one thing causing um, the other. If if we don't take care of some of these things, we 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 might think that is just um, um, using it. And just as we young as we are, as young as we are, I'm, I believe that we have young people on this call. If we don't shape the future that we want, um, a time would come. Everything that uh, we 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 come in contact with, with plastic. Let me just say this final thought. So I was just watching the research and then they indicated that now um, human fecal matter, according to the research, has strains of plastic. That means 
plastic has just gone from just being pollution, but then it has entered into the food chain, which my uh, uh, senior scientist Otu can speak extensively on it. So this is something that we can wrap our minds uh, around and then look at how it goes. And I don't want to talk so much. I have equally uh, knowledgeable people on the panel that can also share their ideas on it. Thank you. Thank you. So Nana Otu, um, Maxwell has mentioned your name. <laughs> What can you say about the, the outstanding issue? Thank you very much. Um, I'm happy to have a wonderful team here to do this discussion with or this discourse with. I'm very happy seeing the team we have around. Um, I think my learned colleague, Maxwell, um, shared a brief explanation of what the environment is. And so from ecological studies, we normally will say the environment refers to your immediate surrounding. However, in contemporary times and in terms of sustainable development, we look at the environment as the planet. And so nature becomes the environment. And then because these issues are interrelated and they're intercorrelated, we don't want to separate them when we're discussing them. And so, yes, the environment refers to your immediate environment. However, the whole planet also becomes an environment for humanity when you see humanity as a whole. And so when you talk about the environment, you're talking about what you see in Ghana here, what you see in, uh, around the globe everywhere that becomes the environment you talk about. So the planet becomes the environment, nature becomes the environment, then just your immediate surrounding also becomes the environment. And um, the truth of the matter is that due to geographical separations and then due to geographical um, analysis, there are pressing environmental issues in each of the geographical settings. And so that is very also, it's also, um, 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 it's there. That issue should also be addressed. And so when you look at the global south, some of the issues you might be facing might be different from what um, those out there will be facing. However, we normally will sit down and look at all these, average it, and then get what we think at any present time or at any time T, the whole globe is facing. And so currently after 2020, um, the UN sat down, they agreed, and then they came out with a, um, the triple planetary crisis, as Maxwell talked about, that they are the, in fact, the leading cause so far as with um, environmental degradation is concerned. And they came with biodiversity loss, climate change, and then pollution. Pollution in three ways. They were looking at land pollution, water pollution, they were looking at air pollution. It will surprise you to know that initially, Ghana didn't have a problem with air pollution. But now air pollution is the second, um, I think, the, yes, is the second, second highest cause of um, death. In Ghana, and so we should, we should, we should, we should set up as a nation. Um, in the 2000s and then the in the early 2000s, climate change was not an issue in Ghana, in fact, but now it's an issue. Very diversity loss. You know, we are having genetic diseases now. Just um, this, just um, this particular afternoon, I was in a team of students. We were discussing monkeypox. Um, you see, these are issues you have to think about them. Not taking the environment aside. You should think about them looking at the environment because these are zoonotic diseases. And zoonotic diseases will come from animals and then they are getting to us. And so I think that when we talk about the environment and the pressing issues, I would want to be country specific and speak to the context of the Ghanaian so that we can appreciate it very well in our local setting. Yes, we can talk about international, uh, international issues, but let's leave that for international conferences when we are speaking on international platforms. But since we are in Ghana here, and then we are doing this basically to create awareness for the young people in Ghana to understand and appreciate the fact that environmental degradation is having a cause, it's having a problem, it's having an impact on our social being, it's having an impact on our economic being, it's having an impact even on our moral aspects of life. I think we have to limit it to Ghana as a nation. And that is where I would want to zero in and draw more attention and concentrate my energies. My learned colleague, Max, talked about plastic pollution. Not too long ago, I have started a campaign, Plastic Strike. Those who have been following on social media can attest to it. Um, yes, we are doing a plastic strike as Eco Warriors Movement because the quantum of, now when you do waste stream analysis of any household in Ghana, and I'm talking about waste stream analysis by quantity, not by uh, percentage mass. When you do waste stream analysis of every household in Ghana, you realize that the percentage composition of plastic is higher than any other thing. One of the days where we used to have about 60% um, by mass, organic waste. Now it's totally reduced. The last thing I did with some students, we are having about, I'm not talking about by mass, but this time I'm talking about by volume and composition. We're having something around 80% plastic waste composition. 
And that is an issue for us to discuss as candidates. That is a point we have to sit down as young people to discuss. And so for me, the current issue, the pressing issue for us as Ghanaians is plastic pollution. And that we have to look at it with a keen eye and a red eye. In as much as we develop advocacy points around it, we should also develop practical ways. And then let me talk about the three-legged approach to sustainable development so that we can appreciate this. Please forgive me if I'm doing a little bit scientific and lecture thing. I do lecture, so some of these things will come up when I'm, when I'm talking about them. You know, when you talk about sustainability, there is this three-legged approach that we use to it. You are looking at the society as one point, you're looking at the environment at one point, you're looking at the economy at one point. So we are able to just approach the three and get a better, get a point where these three will meet. We are not developing sustainability. And so we look at the sustainable development goals, all the same of them, they are addressing the five pieces of development, but all the five pieces of development resonate on this three-legged approach of us now. So we look at society, we look at the economy, then we look at the environment. But it looks like in contemporary terms, you're looking at socio-economic development, not environmental socio-economic development. And so we are living on the environment, then we are considering socio-economic development. That is where we are getting to where we are now. And so, um, yes, I want it to be very practical, not too theoretical and too scientific. So I would want to um, calm down some of these things and leave it for others to also share their thoughts on it. And as we go forward, we try to look into it and then talk more about these issues. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think that has been insightful. The other speakers will, will bear witness to that. But in as much as we speak about the issue, we have to look at the, the aftermath of what it's causing to the environment. So, um, Anyarika, if you can help us, what has been the impact or, yeah, what, what would be the impact on us and like, Otu has mentioned society, he has mentioned um, the environment, he has mentioned the economy. So what, what will this impact of this environment crisis do to us, one, as, as, as a society, two, as human beings living in it, and three, our economy, if you can help us in that aspect. Okay. Now, we, we, can, we can divide this into two phases to look at it on the, the impact of it on the economic growth of the country and as individuals. Then the second part would be looking at development as a whole. So having social, cultural, and other forms of growth in it. Now to start from the, the, the earlier points, to talk about economic growth. Now the impact of it is that currently as we, as we speak, Ghana has banned the exportation of certain grains with maize included. Yes, it's been blamed. You know, the, the government has said that, okay, because of the Russia-Ukraine war, that is why they are banning that to make sure that there's enough food. But aside that, there are other issues that's also affecting the food security and the water security. Let's put it simply this way. When we say food security, we mean the amount of food that is really available to us to eat in simple terms. Water security, the amount of water, potable water available to us as humans, as Ghanaians in our homes to consume and to use for industrial, both industrial and, and domestic purposes. The impact on economic growth is that if you wake up in the morning, you don't have potable water to drink. And you and I know that water is life. So if you close our eyes and to, to the things that are, negatively affecting the environment, to the sun waning, to the galamse, to the tree felling, and to other things that are destroying the environment, making sure that we get portable water. Then economic growth wise, we are going to go down the drain. We wouldn't be able to make some money. That is true. That means some jobs will be lost because the cost of production would have increased. In this phase, again, we are looking at industrialization as the engine of growth. In Ghana, you know, developing countries are looking at how best they can push their growth to another level. And even to rub shoulders with the developed countries. Now, if the things, the factors that are supposed to support your industrialization are being tampered with, are being reduced, then that means that your industrialization will fail. So if you need some things, for instance, we are going, we are still looking at the economic growth and how the impact of the um, destruction of the environment 
And so what the, the impact of UE destroying the, the environment on economic growth. If we fail to understand the connection between environment and economic growth, then we have, we have no will. And there's nothing that will push us to speak up and to understand the impending dangers of what we are doing today. So that's for the economic growth. Now we look at development as a whole. Now development looks at social development, cultural development, and other things. The impact of climate change, the impact of environmental degradation goes beyond just the food that we eat. It also impacts relations. When there's a change in the environment, it will affect land tenor issues. It will also affect the way people relate with others in terms of family. Now, people would move all the way from the Northern region, the Upper East, the Upper West, into the Southern sector of Ghana. Why? Because they have only one rainy season and a long dry season. Now, if they are moving, because they're moving down to work, get some money, when it's the rainy season, they go back again. So here you have migration. And when people migrate, that means that where they come from become less developed. So you would have cases where people from Upper East are in Accra, and some of them wouldn't be able to trace back to their roots. So what happens then? So that there's migration, and there's the, the, the number of people who move back to their families to reconnect and to even develop their communities is less. The impact of environmental degradation shouldn't be looked at it only from the economic perspective, but here in case also the social perspective. Now people have to move miles away to access water, to access the basic needs of life. Young women wouldn't be able to get the best of sexual reproductive health because if they don't have enough water to clean themselves when they are in the administration, that's a problem. That means they wouldn't be able to attend lectures, attend classes. When you pick up the various you know, campuses where there are water crises, they wouldn't be able to attend lectures. They wouldn't be able to even go to the basic school that it would have been possible if they had water closer to them. So the whole issue about environmental degradation is that the impact needs to be understood. But how then do you make people understand that what you're doing today would affect you in the near future? It is when you put it in their minds for them to understand that, look, whatever you're doing here will cause this. So here we are more become like a prophet saying that what you're doing is going to cause a problem. So don't do it again. But while people are individualistic, so they tend to look at more of their profit gains. But as a collective, in changing that mindset, in building an eco-conscious society, you tend to now use examples. And those examples are really happening here. Where you cite a situation to say that, look, now people within Accra don't have water at some points in, in, in the days or in the months. What is the issue? Oh, they said, no, the people are doing some galamse here, and that is why it's affecting them. Now, when we are able to make people understand that it's because of galamse, that is the, that is the reason for they not having the water. That is it's what is happening now. Would these people also wake up and then go to do the galamse? Because it would have cost them a lot. So the whole issue about environmental degradation, its impact all boils down to the co-conscious society, that if we really indeed want people to act right, it's about a mindset, it's a behavior, you know, behavioral thing. Would someone understand that I have the money to pay for the waste I'm creating, but do I think about where the waste ends? That is when the media comes in to do more of education, to do more of advocacy, sensitization, and come out with facts and figures to convince the population that, look, whatever you're doing, you need to change that approach. Yes, the rich are few, and they are controlling a lot of resources and properties. When you pick a young person and you ask him or her to explain environmental degradation in the local language, that young person is not going to use tenses or 
um, phrases in English, the person would try as much as possible to use things closer to him, closer things within the language to explain environmental degradation. And that is how people will tend to understand and appreciate what it means to mine illegally, pollute the water bodies, and its impact on the society. It all comes back again and asks the question that, how do we then build an, an eco-conscious society when people don't have a connection to their own language and a connection to the environment? If you ask someone to explain climate change, the person will explain climate change in English brilliant, in a brilliant form. But when you ask that same person, explain climate change in your local language, the person tends to use, oh, I'm, 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 I'm not um, an Akan, I speak Gurone. So I would use tense to say, this is, these are tenses that I'm using. These are examples that are, this, this is the, how to call it? The experiences of the people that I'm speaking to them. So most of the communication is from, I try to use the English to build an eco-conscious society to understand the impact of it. But using language as a key tool, not only English language, but using a local language will bring people to understanding that in as much as there's an issue we are looking at, but immediately in the past and folk tales in storytelling, this is what happened and this is how we understood it. Now we move on to this place. Most of us wouldn't recall or might not even think that Accra once had trees. But the older, the older folks will tell you that Accra had trees, but now they've cleared all the trees and what we have are buildings. It is through the language. And it's through the language that stories are created, stories are developed. You might not see its effect, but subtly it brings to mind what it means to be an eco-conscious citizen in your own society, in your own small way. Okay. So the impact of climate change is not, shouldn't we look at it, um, as Otu Champon said, don't, don't, when you get to the international stages, yes, we, we use the language there. When we come down back to where we come from, let's use, let's come back to our own experiences and how we can come together as one, come up with solutions that speak to our, uh, our, our being and as citizens. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. So you actually speaking of we being um, contextual with the issue at hand. <laughs> I used to remember that um, in the past, the traditional society of Ghana then had um, rules and regulations that has to do with um, the gods do this on this particular day um, because this thing is sacred. This thing is, is yeah, sacred, I mean. So people do not do certain things, especially at the, at the water, at the sea side or the river banks people do not go to the forest on certain days who are not allowed to cut trees and all uh, in the in the past yes they it used to um protect the environment but this question i want to go to emmanuel Amaya. what do you think is the current issue um for us to forgo uh traditional ways of protecting the environment and leaning on to what we are currently seeing at the moment Thank you very much, Abba. Before I go into that, I would, I would want to touch a bit on the issue in terms of context. When it comes to climate change, usually initially the, the discussion was more focused on something that is very far away from us. By recent times, you could see that it's, um, it's actually with us. If you go to Keta, the tidal waves that destroyed communities in Keta is a prime example of the impact of climate change, really, the, the, the ice melting at the Arctic's increasing sea level and then pushing inwards. The last time I was in Keta, you have a conversation with people and they will tell you that I used to, my house used to be here and they are pointing towards the sea. So the sea is moving inwards, inland, wiping away a lot of coastal communities. So essentially their livelihoods will be destroyed and they have to move in and in. It's also estimated that a lot of islands will be submerged in the sea if we don't address the issue of climate change. And so that is something that is very clear in terms of how climate change is impacting Ghana directly. If you go up north, there are issues of women working long hours to get water. And again, that is why a government would come out like, let me do something about one dam and one or something like that village. 
because really there's issue of climate change that is impacting them. Again, flooding is an issue that we, we, we subscribe to it as a poor drainage system. But there are, if you watch carefully, there are, the volume of rainfall we, we get recently is beyond just an issue of a drainage system. Clearly, the climate is shifting. When I used to work as a journalist, I, I, I had a conversation with some farmers. That's one of the last stories I did before I moved into proper advocacy. And uh, I remember you have a conversation with some of the farmers, and they will tell you that uh, it, it essentially, uh, they used to predict the rain, the rainy season and the dry season. So during the rainy season, they prepare and then they plant their seedlings and then during the getting to the dry season, they harvest. Now during the harvest period, which is supposed to be dry, they experience heavy rainfall and then their farm gets destroyed. And this also has an impact on food security. So in the coming years, how would we be able to farm without knowing when, how the rain will come and when the dry season would, would also prevail? And these are issues that hit home directly. Again, if you look at the Global Forest Watch, they spoke about Ghana as one of the leading countries in terms of forest uh, loss. I mean, annually since about 2000, the year 2000, we lose about 10% of our, our forest cover. And the forest, we all know the impact, the importance of the forest in our climate uh, dispensation in terms of cooling the environment, absorbing the carbon dioxide and all that. So it's, it's with us, plastic pollution, you go to the coastal communities, fishermen go to sea, they cast their nets and all they are getting is plastic, very little fish, a lot of plastic. And so our livelihood or our, our actions and inaction is, is hurting the environment. And we all would bear the, the brunt of this, this pollution. And when you talk about the traditional, our, our ancestors and old people develop certain kind of uh, uh, traditional rules to guide us as and where protect the environment. Let's say on Thursdays or Mondays, nobody should go to the farm or in this month, nobody should go to the forest to hunt for animals or um, the sea. We have a, so, I mean, recently, one of the things the fisheries ministry did was the, the close season. It's something that is right from the textbook of our traditional leaders. So they close the sea so that people don't go to sea for some month or a month so that the, the, the fish stock is replenished so that they can get, uh, so you don't get to harvest the, the fingerlings or the, the small fishes. So I think that generally as a country, there's a lot we can learn from in terms of our traditional leaders, how they used to implement certain rules to protect the environment. But when it comes to uh, the impact, we are really feeling that people are not really aware. Just like Daniel said, in terms of climate awareness, Afrobarometer report pegs it at uh, 44%, about 44% of Ghanaians have never heard of climate change. They don't know what it's about. They don't know a, a nothing like, so the, for such people, when you tell somebody not to burn, uh, cut down tree, they don't really get the essence because let's say, uh, typically a uh, uh, forest, it provides about uh, water, it's a, it's a water source or provides water to about four or 5 million Ghanaians per the report, uh, a Rocha report and all that. And when uh, there is an attempt to destroy the forest or mine bauxite or something, if we have an, a, a, a citizen who are very conscious, eco-conscious, and they understand the importance of this forest, this forest, they will, they will rise up and, and protect and demand that government halt. Again, the same with Achimota Forest. Somebody who asked you about say almost declassify a and I say for forest security, what now? So people don't really know. Okay, so this we are in a crowd, there's an only green belt left. What is it? What is the purpose of living? Achimota Forest and people don't have access to land. They want to build. But this forest plays a very important role in our ecosystem. And as much as we continue to create that awareness, uh, and then we working with the traditional authorities and religious bodies, all these people must come together because Ghanaians have a huge respect for traditional authorities. And so sometimes they might not listen to government. You have all the nice policies, you have all the nice laws on the environment, but if people are not ready to listen, what other approach is possible? Uh, if let's say two forces don't do something, or Chihine or Tugbafed and all our traditional leaders, people will really pay attention. And so there are other options in terms of traditional leaders, religious bodies, a church, we can bring an environmental uh, uh, researcher or conversationist to come and uh, uh, create awareness this particular Sunday after the preaching, we'll talk about the environment. All these are ways that we can use to uh, to, to protect or safeguard the environment whilst creating a, a conscious population who, who put the, the environment at the heart of what they do. And so that's what I can say uh, with respect to uh, the impact and of course, uh, linking it with our traditional authority and other uh, relevant uh, stakeholders.
Okay, thank you very much. And um, when you were mentioning um, the fact that the sea was closed, honestly, for the first time, when I saw that in the news, it was funny. And, you know, I didn't understand why the, the sea was closed. I, I believe a lot of us didn't understand because um, in the past, traditional leaders didn't even probably explain to us the reason why this is so and this is not so. And that is why we, we now in this generation have been called to, to lay emphasis on the fact that um, or the importance of open knowledge in protecting our environment. That is why we have all of you on board to tell us all those all those things. I believe Ruby, if someone was telling you that um, the sea is, is locked or being prevented for, for, uh, for farmers, to, uh, for fishers, uh, fishermen, sorry, to go out there to fish, what, what would be your first, um, how do I call it, your first understanding of the sea being locked or closed from fishermen? Yeah, I don't know if I get your questions right, but, if someone tells me the the fish is sorry the sea has been closed i'll definitely think that is one of those um uh how do they call it cultural things like because of um traditional stuff like um taboos yes 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 I think it's maybe a taboo and maybe if you go there, you could die or something like that. So these are things that um, our forefathers or our traditional people used to do in order to prevent people from doing that. And you and I, when we were kids, we were told that we don't have to sing in the bathroom. If you sing in the bathroom, something is going to happen to you. If you pound fufu in the night, something is going to happen to you. And we grew up seeing that all these things were not actually true, but they were, they were put in place to sort of like prevent you from doing that basically. And so these taboos that were set in place by indig indigenous people tend to preserve an, our environment and the things that um, surround us like the water bodies and all that. So that, that's basically what I'll say. Um, Talking about open knowledge, open knowledge is very important to us to help us to understand um, our society and also shape the attitudes of people. And I'll say, and I'll say a story. I was one day I was having a conversation with my partner, and he was telling me how we could get as twice as much um, vitamins in apple in banana. So we could get two times in banana. So this knowledge itself can shape the, the way that um, when I go out, I'm going to buy food. It can, it can tell me a lot. For instance, if I go out and I want to buy apple, I see, and I see banana, I know that, oh, banana has twice as much as the nutrients in apple. In the same way, um, when we, for instance, one of, one, another story that I'll say, um, one time I was looking for schools about Ghana, like secondary schools. I was helping my younger brother to, to select a school. So I wanted to read about school. And I went online and I was amazed that I could barely get any tangible information about all the schools in Ghana online. And this is so difficult because it made my decision making very difficult because I couldn't find what I was looking for. So imagine, do I need to visit each and every school to be able to decide which school that I want my brother to choose or select. And so this comes again, like a question again, if we're able to have information about our environment, about what is happening, about the research statistics online, it helps people to appreciate what's going on in our environment. It helps people to um, better adapt to some of these um, problems. And at the moment, when we look at, globally, we, we, we all understand that Africa is most vulnerable when it comes to climate change. But globally, when there's funding, Africa is least funded for climate change topics in the world. It's about 5% of the global funding, which is very low because as a country or as a, as a continent, which is most vulnerable to climate change, being less researched, then and then we have a lot 
of, 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 we have a lot to do to be able to understand the problem very well, which is why open knowledge is very important. We have people doing research about climate change, but some of these research are not even in open space for people to use or people to understand. We are on paid war. So how do people even get that information to be able to make decisions in their, in their places or wherever they are in, in, in Africa? So this is a very growing and worrying problem that we need to solve. And that comes, and that brings me to say that Wikipedia has been one of the open platforms in the world that people go online to search for climate change information. And people will say that Wikipedia is not a credible source. Wikipedia, it's a very credible source because of its verifiability policy. They are not just information that are being written there for uh, from just nowhere, these information are being verified because Wikipedia is not a platform for novel research, which means that these any information that is put on Wikipedia has a source or a reference that people um, refer to. And so Wikipedia is a very great platform for us to do a lot of these documenting because, I mean, look at the statistics for global funding for research. It means that a lot of research are not happening, but Wikipedia provides us that platform where we can do our research because we've seen the news. There are a lot of news about happenings in, in our environment, in our societies and all that. So these are places where we can document some of these happenings and then come up with a nice um, research. Wikipedia functions more like a literature review where people add information from time to time. And so this is a very, I, I was reading an article about um, Ivory Coast, Ivory Coast um, toxic waste dump in 2000. And so I was very much impressed about that article on Wikipedia because um, this was something that happened in 2006 where um, a ship from one of the countries dumped some waste uh materials at the port in ivory coast and that led to more than forty thousand people seeking for medical attention and about 17, 17 people died as a result and this is a very good research extensive research that has been done by a lot of people from around um, africa or from ivory coast or wherever they they are contributing to this article giving us an understanding of what actually happened and uh how the situation impacted people and what was done. And this is a learning for everyone because if, we, if I read this article and I see similar situation or happening in my country, I'll be able to prevent it. And that is what we are talking about, open knowledge, knowledge that is accessible to everyone. And Wikipedia makes it easy, even much easy to find some of these information wherever you are. Because I mean, sometimes we're doing research, we struggle a lot to find where exactly these sources are because there are a lot of things online i mean you, you can imagine when i when i go on the internet I, I usually it's easy for me to find things in ghana than to find things somewhere else but wikipedia provides that one platform where it's easy for you to find that information that you're looking for irrespective of where you are and so if we are empowered to be able to put that knowledge on Wikipedia. I think our societies will be able to have easy access to some of this information that can inform our attitude, improve our attitudes, and, and further improve um, our environment. This is what I'll, I'll say briefly. I'll let someone also add to it. Okay, okay. Thank you very much for that insightful um, message on, on the open knowledge and what it can be used to do in promoting um, a, a better environment for all of us. So to um, Maxwell and Otto, who are environmentalists and climate change activists, you have also been Wikimedians in, in, in the past and still are. Um, what are you doing with um, open knowledge or what do you seek to do with open knowledge in your advocacy? So I'll start with Maxwell. Okay, um, thank you very much uh, once again. I uh, so with um, the nexus of building the the or creating the synergy between open knowledge and climate is very relevant. And as um, a climate activist and then um, an educator and someone who's very interested in open um, 
I've been a part of uh, Open Foundation for quite a number of years, and I've also served as a trainer. And also, um, um, I started the Kumasi Wiki Hub as well. So that, that gives a, a background on my interest area. So uh, looking at the synergy, it's, it's very relevant that everything that we, we know about climate um, crisis or whatever that we know now, it's based on information and then the knowledge out there. But then putting this in context, just as um, uh, Ameyao uh, said, you realize that information over the years have uh, been, have, be, have gone through a process which uh, has always been um, locally relevant and then um, culturally appropriate. These are two fundamental blocks that shapes knowledge. So if you look at crime, uh, the, 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 the climate issues, you realize that you and I would only know climate issues based on the information that we have or information that we have read. Assuming if all this information you have to pay to access, it then brings an element of exclusion. Imagine if uh, having access to libraries you have to pay, it brings a form of exclusion to knowledge. So it creates a class system, which over the years, if you look through history or you read through history, you realize that the people who had access to knowledge one way or the other dominated or, or, or had that power. It created that class system where just a sect and a few people had access to knowledge. So you realize that if we were to look at that age in this age, again, putting uh, um, climate uh, uh, in context, you realize that those who may have had the information would be would contribute to only uh, solving the climate issues. But I realized that being a part of the open movement or being a part of open, believing in the vision and then the mission of open, where information is made readily accessible and then readily open to all to read without being charged to remix, to use it in any how you want. You realize that understanding of or, or having a, a, a blueprint on solving some of these issues first you have to get to understand and know about the information. And that is where Wikipedia comes in. So Wikipedia tells um, people or, or everybody that look, there is a platform that people are curating content, putting content there, have access to that content, read it, use it in any how you are. Inform others about it. In fact, it even goes beyond just the English language. There are indigenous language, um, there are uh, language communities that are springing up, all trying to decolonize the internet or decolonize the, the, the web on information um, sharing and then information um, access. So just as you said, as a climate activist, I believe in information. I read information every day. I have to stay um, 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 on top of issues. And then that directs me to uh, uh, searching on the information. And now you know that in the 21st century, we have moved from where we used to go for information, but right now information is coming to us. So it, it shifts our mind as climate activists to know where to go to, um, um, to the internet for information and not just be um, um, a receiver or a reader on the internet, but it gives you an opportunity to also contribute knowledge to the ecosystem as open. Let me give a clear case uh, to whatever I'm saying. So for example, there is this imagine, um, uh, community, which is the Ghana Pidgin um, um, community or, or la language that is springing up. You realize that there are a lot of people who want to speak or would want to read in the Pidgin language. So as part of that, and as part of being a climate activist, what I can then do is to translate most of the climate issues or climate information that are in existence or create new ones so that people who ordinarily would be excluded will now be included. So that is the vision of open, having it in there for people to access it and, and bridge the knowledge divide, which is very, very relevant in the open. To, to end it up, uh, Wiki for Human Rights uh, had um, um, a, a line that I quote, and I love it very much, it says, access to knowledge about crisis is not available to everyone. And then against this backdrop is why they decided that, look, let us try and see how information about uh, 
climate crisis will be readily available and accessible. So um, just to end all that I have said, the plenty talks and all that is just to let us understand that we have just contextualized the climate uh, um, issues together with our love for climate and then still con continuing with the advocacy, which makes us very relevant as climate activists. Thank you very much. Otto, if you are there, what, what can you add to what um, Maxwell has said so far? Thank you very much, um, Christabel. I would always want to set um, a background to this, and I want to use this opportunity to do that. Normally, I do that when I have the opportunity. My colleagues have actually talked about the open space aspect, which I will add more to it um, with time. But that's what I want us to look at and then understand. It's an opportunity for us to learn and also increase our understanding so far as climate change and the call to environmental sustainability is concerned. Now, I like um, what Daniel said earlier. I think the time for us as Ghanaians to change our approach towards climate change education is now. We have to move to a level where we can use evidence-based education to, let, to get people to the idea that climate change is, is happening and is actually killing our people. Um, yeah, I understand that it's a scientific concept and then um, I don't need to go into it because most of us might not even know what greenhouse gases are and then the role they play in the environment. But from 1989, from the Montreal Protocol to the Kyoto Protocol of around um, 2005, though started in um, 1999, ratified in 2005, run down to 2016 when we had the Paris Agreement. There has been this change in the structure or the strategy in addressing greenhouse gases where they are trying to make it more practical for people to appreciate it. And so when um, Ima talked about the Keta Sea Defense Project, I think it's a nice opportunity for us to use that to explain to people in the Keta zone and in that the Avu, Avu Lagoon area, I've done some research work in that area very well, to explain to them, this is what is called impact-based analysis. So you take the people to the place. Just as he said, people will say, my house used to be here, it's no longer here. This is what we have to do to make people understand. Now, if you are my age, in the 90s, we had this program on television called By the Fireside. In the 90s, we realized that morals were declining. The moral levels in our children were declining. And so By the Fireside by Mamedo Okono Den was a means to be able to teach children to live with good morals. And so that is why we had Anansi, and then all the greed, what will end Anansi. So, if you're around that, if, if you're young and you see that around that time, you realize that every child wanted to watch by the fireside. In their early, we were learning. So to our subconscious, they were teaching us good morals. To the 2000s, when HIV became an issue, and that was when they started just, just the MTGs. Then things we do for love comes in to teach children and young people that HIV is real. And you have to be, you have to live a just life. The ABCs of whatever came in. Now, these were structural approaches to be able to address the pertaining issue as at that time. But, and then I'll agree with what um, 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 the WHO has said, the current issue we have in our country now is climate change. The current issue we have in our country now is environmental degradation. And so what are we doing to address these things? We need evidence-based analysis to be able to prove to people that is what we are doing. And so I'm a grassroots, I work with a grassroots organization and then people who lived in the coal zones, when you're are coming down, you know, they enjoy relief rainfall. So in the first um, first two weeks in April, that has been the climate. They experience high sunshine. After the two weeks, they enjoy the relief rainfall. That has been the pattern there. And this year, I took rice farmers to the field to explain to them why things have changed. And so people will plant maize, uh, sorry, maize, maize, yeah, they will grow maize in the, in the first two weeks, awaiting um, the rainfall that will come. And this year, they had to cut down their maize and burn them because the rains didn't come at that time for them. That is climate change, and people should appreciate these things. So we have to get to a level where we use evidence-based education to explain to people. And then the language, as Danny said, we have started something as eco-warriors. We are doing environmental, access to environmental information for all. I'm doing some storytelling with kids. I'm trying to reinvent the by the fireside approach in a more environmental way. You remember Captain Planet in those days? I'm trying to reinvent it in the local language. So if environmental information for what we are doing is that we are trying to translate all this climate information into local languages, and we are doing about four local languages now. 
so that people can appreciate it, people can understand what climate change is. I have had the opportunity to be in communities where people think that the change in rainfall pattern is as a result of punishment from the gods because of bad governance. And this is the mentality people have. We don't have to blame them because they don't know the science behind this whole thing. We have to take time to take them through it to an evidence-based analysis for them to appreciate that climate change might not just be a case from the gods, but it might be from our own anthropogenic activities. So this is how things are going. Now I talked about um, our susceptibility as a nation to climate change. You see, um, every nation is vulnerable to climate change at a point. So vulnerability to climate change is, 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 is a subject of your susceptibility and then your adaptive capacity. This is a bit scientific, but I'll try to relate it. I'll try to come down for us to understand. Now, a country like Denmark, Denmark is a low-lying country, but half of it is low-lying. And so Denmark should is susceptible to flood and therefore climate change with a uh, high level in sea, sea levels. But then because they have high adaptive capacity in that they have been able to build dikes and stuff like that, be able to protect themselves against it. So when you check the vulnerability of climate change and uh, the vulnerability of Denmark to climate change, as to Ghana, you will like that Ghana is more vulnerable to climate change than Denmark, who is a low-lying country. Because in as much as we are not that low-lying, we don't have adaptive capacity. And so always our vulnerability rises. And this is where we have to explain to people that don't think of the fact that climate change is far from us because we don't have any adaptive capacity or well, we have less adaptive capacity. The little that hits us becomes great. Now, in, two, in, in 2019, there was only one cyclone that occurred in Africa. And that was the one in Zimbabwe, Cyclone Idai. There were about 17 other cyclones. But we realized that Cyclone Idai killed around 400 people. That is the highest. Fatality was highest in Cyclone Idai that occurred in Africa. Just one about 400 people, about 17 occurred in the Europe and Americas, and yet they recorded the least number of deaths. Why? Because they have high adaptive capacity, but we do not have. So this is the level we have to get to. Then let us try to say this once in our local language so that the people will appreciate it. The local farmer who is at Kaufudwa, who is at Betwin um, Nyansa, who is at Puaye um, Mobo, um, 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 would have to understand this in the language you can appreciate. We talk all the big English, we speak all the grammar, and yet we don't get down to these people to explain to them. And yet they are the farmers who are highly hit by the impacts of climate change. And that is where open knowledge comes in. That's why I love you so much. And so I go on to say that funding is a problem. Yes, I understand. But let's realize that compare the vulnerability of Ghana to a country like Nepal, to a country like Bangladesh elsewhere. As any global leader sits down and analyzes vulnerability, these countries are high so far as vulnerability to climate change is concerned. Than us. So they will shift more funds to those places. However, as Ghanaians, what are we doing? And so we introduce the principle of environmental titan. We don't have to always sit down waiting for funding from elsewhere. I'm telling you as a gospel fact, some of this will not come. We have to take actions now. If we can pay 10% tie to a God who we cannot see, how much more to the environment that sustains our, our lives as humanity? We should be able to get to the level where we can mean we can manage from our own funds create a pool, and that will bring me to my three C's of development, collaboration, coordination, and co-creating. We need to collaborate, work as a team in solving these issues. If not, our children's children will always blame this generation. So we need to collaborate. We need to coordinate. Individual activities should be coordinated into a greater good. Then we need to co-create, and that is where the open knowledge comes in. I remember just recently, I put an article on Wikipedia on Batakari. Then somebody from UK, Message me, tells me that Batakari, he thinks this is how I didn't even know myself, but he added some input to it through my talk. Then we agreed on it. I researched on it, and it was true what he was saying. Then we, we added a lot to it. This is co creation. How can we just transport this into the environmental sector? We will be co creating knowledge. All of us on this platform listening to me now, we have wild and good ideas. But the only good thing is that when these ideas are put together into a unit, we can harness its importance. And that is where we have to call create solutions specific to Ghana as a nation, specific to your community, specific to your immediate environment. Solve the issue within there. So I normally say start local and then go global. So we have to be able to come out with ideas where we will call create. And the open knowledge, the open movement has given us that platform. I love common so much because it gives me the opportunity to communicate my environmental stories in a graphical manner, in a multimedia form, people can appreciate it. We started a project where we're looking at converting this knowledge, um, climate information into God, tree, whatever, sometimes ago, and it was wonderful. 
Yes, we got stuck with funding, so we have paused on that. We are organizing funding and we will go in there, continue those projects. So what am I what am I trying to end at? I think that the open knowledge has given us a tool, and then we should use that tool to be able to address our environment. But yes, how can they know if they are not told? Because we should always be mindful of the information that we put out there. And that is why some of us as environmental scientists, some of us as environmental advocates must get the information right, communicate this information to young people so that they can then look at the information that they have received, analyze it, digest the information, create locally made solutions, tailor made for their environment, begin to share them using the open knowledge, and then we can make a headway. I have had a lot of projects I have done using the open. Now, you remember just not long ago, we had the Wiki Green Conference where um, myself, Maxwell, and then um, yeah, I think he's even here on this call. I saw him on the call. We put together, Stephen, we put together the Wiki uh, Green Conference just to create the awareness. But then we have to go to the level where as Daniel is using the local language, I am, I am an Akan, I am using the Ashanti. That's what I'm doing, so I'm doing very well now of late. I try to speak the tree very well because you look at even how the, the months are named. It tells you about the climate in those times. January, Opepon, that means Opepon. Ope means drought. Pon means greatest. So the highest or the greatest drought is supposed to happen in January. Then February becomes Ojifu. That means that in Ojifu, you are preparing for some showers of rain to prepare your farm. Then Obenim comes, the Oforisuo comes in April. So Oforisuo means that now you are getting the rains so you can begin farming. So this is how our people in those times, so when you begin to use this evidence-based approach to explain to our people why the, why the climate has changed. Because now in Oforisio, uh, Odifo, you are not getting rains in Odifo. You are not getting the showers that we expect in Odifo. And that is what is telling you that climate change is actually happening. And so the change in rainfall patterns should be. Thank you very much. Let me let me end this. You are going to speak on and on and because your submissions are, are quite, I don't know, it's your field and it, it, we could feel the emotions behind your submission. So we would like to take short, short statements from um, Daniel and Emmanuel Yeboa um, from their own space, how they are looking at using um, open knowledge to create the awareness of the environmental crisis and how it can be kept. So we are using about two, three minutes to, to round up. So Emmanuel. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> the name is Yami, I say Emmanuel Boa. <laughs> okay, so I think that when it comes to knowledge sharing, it's one of the things I work with the Youth Climate Council as a communications officer. I say essentially we develop communication tools to, to create awareness on climate change. And the second of June, we had a uh, a climate reporting workshop. We organized a climate reporting workshop in partnership with the Center for Climate Change. Trying to do is to enhance the capacity of journalists to write stories. We are hoping that we could see a lot of climate stories on the front page of our newspapers. Climate stories dominating the news. If you look at what happened in Keta, it became an MVP versus NBC matter. The same way for Achimota Forest, it became an MVP versus NBC matter. But in the heart of those conversations is the environment, climate change. And so for we as YCC and for we as young people, we are willing to partner with, I mean, the Open Foundation, West Africa, all other organizations that are present in this uh, call. We are looking at how we can share knowledge and then how we build our knowledge base. Because you can't just go and talk about climate change when you don't have the, the means to communicate effectively on it. You should be able to explain it to the, the ordinary taxi driver on the, on the street, the coconut seller, anybody, so that they are all aware. When they become conscious, when people become conscious, they understand the motive behind what they do and how it is hurting the environment. Then it's the first step in, 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 in helping address this environmental uh, degradation issue. So for, for me, I think uh, Nano too said a lot in terms of uh, what uh, open knowledge and sharing can do beyond Wikipedia. You can also organize workshops like we have an effective climate communication workshop coming up in Kumase on the 17th, I think. And I mean, the researchers, PR people come on board and teach our young climate activists how they can uh, communicate on climate change, talk about climate change in a way that resonates with people uh, across all levels, secondary, university, I mean, the ordinary people on the street, any 
anybody. And and I also I want to encourage young people to be able to develop innovative ways of sharing climate information or knowledge. If you are knowledgeable in uh, climate change or environmental issues, you have TikTok. You can do a video that sniper video, 30 seconds, one minute video. Instagram reel, the same thing. If you have basic knowledge in Canva, graphic design, you can just do some simple graphic template that shows uh, uh, very little, little information about climate or Ghana and the environment. And for me, this is all some of the steps we can take in order to, to create that awareness and share knowledge and and together, as, as young people, we can make the impact we, we want to make. Um, there are a lot of opportunities, there are a lot of tools, there are a lot of uh, things that we all can do. And in our own small way, don't think that what you are doing is not relevant. I mean, we have uh, the Echo Warriors and all other agencies or youth-led organizations that are doing amazing. And I think that uh, going forward, it can only get better. Okay, so going forward, it can get better. There are, uh, Daniel Anyariga, if you are there, um, can you come in in two minutes to sum up your submissions on the role okay. of open knowledge? So and the role of open knowledge. So the media here, speaking from the media perspective, is that um, if the media churns out factual um, information or come out with information that is credible, it's also part of the open knowledge. Because when, let's say, for instance, the Achimota issue. Now, surprisingly, Achimota Forest didn't have a Wikipedia article. What happened? Lots of the media houses had to write their stories. They had access to sources. Now, CTFM, CTTV sat down, did infographics, presenting the facts as it is. And this gave people um, a clearer picture of what Achimota Forest is and what is the issue at hand. So, yes, um, in the area of open knowledge, um, open knowledge it could, you can look at it from the media perspective about it's continuing playing its role by churning out quality information and facts. Then also the second part is that the media itself also goes in to dig information from other websites, collates them in various forms, and then packages and brings it out to the audience again. So it's in both ways, the media itself churning out content and also the media also taking from the public, uh, the public the, uh, and other sources to come out with something that is much more objective and informs the ordinary citizen. And let me also make this um, clarification here that the media is not only about the mainstream ones where we hear CTFM, CTTV only. There are other forms of the media. So when going to the communities, there are um, community-based radio stations. These people are also a medium through which you can get in touch with people. They are um, places where there are public announcement systems. So let's look at media not only as a mainstream only, but let's also look at it from the other areas where we can push the information and make information or knowledge accessible. And let's not only look at the technology aspect of open knowledge, but let's also look into the oral tradition as an open knowledge access. So if you have people who have lived through the experience and have information to share, kindly record them and write an article, put it in the, in, the, in the digital space for us to access. And that also contributes to the open knowledge movement, to making sure that, just as Ruby said, getting, make, get, making informed decisions. Benjamin also talking about students having a better understanding to develop certain things in order to push the agenda. Then also Champon also come in to say that, let's look at how best we can inform the farmers, the people at the grassroots. And Emmanuel coming in to say, why don't you come join us and let's push the, this agenda. Let's put the information this way and much more effective um, um, approach. So in short, open knowledge depends on us all. If you don't make the knowledge accessible, if you don't make the oral tradition accessible to us, you wouldn't know. So we are all involved just as a rising other youth would say. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. We are all involved. So I would like to use this opportunity to thank all our speakers for their great submissions and making known to us um, whatever knowledge they have. 
and open to all of us here on this platform. And I believe that we have all learned in, in our various spaces how we can all contribute to a healthy environment and um, a healthy planet. Yes, because we only have one planet and that is planet Earth. And if we destroy it, then that is it. So um, I'll give space to about, okay, so Eugene. Um, I think Ruby wants to make a submission. So Ruby, if you can kindly. Yeah, so um, my last contribution is um, we all show, I'm, I'm talking from the Wikipedia perspective. I want to encourage everyone to take advantage to learn about Wikipedia and how to contribute on Wikipedia. I'm saying Wikipedia because let me give you an example. Just last year, we saw uh, high page views on climate change articles. And just on English Wikipedia, we had about 133 million um, page views on just articles about um, climate change, which is a very um, significant um, impact that these information are having out there. And when we looked at other Wikipedia, uh, Wikipedia in other language other than English, we had about 191 million page views in, in a year for only climate change articles. And it tells us how people are going online to look for information about climate change, about what is happening in our environment. As it has become um, the issue or the talk about of today. So it's very important that Africans take opportunity of this platform to increase awareness by contributing information about the environment um, on Wikipedia and Wikimedia Commons. Wikimedia Commons is a sister project of Wikimedia where we donate pictures, uh, videos, and all that. And these are things that people do not know how to use them. Because when we look at the statistics in Africa, we realize that um, even when it comes to content about Africa, it's just 5%, which is very low. We are not well represented on the web. When people want to learn more about climate change um, impact in Africa, it's very, they are not finding those kind of information. And Wikipedia is one platform that is verifiable. We have a lot of experts contributing to, to this platform or checking to ensure that the right thing or the right information is put out there. And so I want to give everyone here the opportunity to be part of a training that is going to happen on the 24th and 25th of June this month in partnership with um, Youth for Climate Council and Open Foundation West Africa to learn how to um, contribute to Wikipedia. So it's a two day um, certificate course that I want to invite everyone. I think I'll let Eugene um, share the registration link. If you're interested to be part of um, the movement, to know how to contribute to these platforms, to, to leverage on your climate actions, please don't hesitate to register and then we'll be with you. Thank you so much um, for the opportunity to share. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much for making it known to our audience today um, how they can participate in, in um, contributing knowledge on Wikipedia. So I would like to remind um, our audience that it is a friendly space and that if you want to contribute or ask questions, you are to raise your hands and then Question answers will be given to your questions. Eugene. So quick one, please. Before we move on to the question and answer segments, I would want all of us to turn our videos. So we take a quick screenshot and then we will have the questions and then answer session. So if we can all turn on our videos. Great. And we're waiting for the others, especially the speakers. We want to see your faces. Great, 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 great. So a few others, and then we'll take the shots. The third way champion, Maxwell. Great. Daniel. Yes, can you, can you take it again? Okay, sure. So we are waiting on you that we'll take the last one. Uh, 
okay, so before Daniel joins us, on the count on three, everybody say cheese. So one, two, three, cheese. Thank you. Yes, Daniel is here. So let's do it one more time. So one, two, three, cheese. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. So first of all, Okay, so as I said, the friendly policy um, or the friendly, yes, it's a friendly space actually. So it comes to play here. If you want to ask a question, kindly raise your hand and then we will call you as well as if you want to add um, up or may, yeah, make a submission or contribution to what our speakers have said, you, you have the right to, but please raise up your hand and then we take it from there. So the space, or oh, we have like about three or four slots here. So let's hear you. Okay, so since I'm not having hands being raised, I think we are all okay with with um how do you call it everything that has been said by our guest speakers or yes, I guess panelists. It looks like somebody raised his hand, Francis Ofosu. Uh, Eman Emmanuel, are you saying something? Someone someone raised his hand, some uh, Francis Ofosu. I can see a hand uh, raised. Okay. Yes. Hi, Francis. Yes, please. Um, the floor is yours. You can ask a question. Oh, okay. Like you mentioned, my name, my name is Francis of Usukobia. CEO of OKF Tree Plantation and OKF Recycling in Eastern Region. Uh, in the first place, I want to thank the speakers. They have done wonderfully well. But I have one or two, some of them are suggestions and some of them are questions. Uh, it's original, the Eastern Regional Forestry Commissioner has given my organization and one organization a we call a Waste Advantage Africa. It's also an environmental organization. Housing seedlings to be planted uh, as part of this Green Ghana agenda. We have not gone for the Sydney yet, uh, but we are stuck with uh, how we can go about it. Then another question I have is, I have packed about 24 uh, bundles of plastic, plastic in, my own, in my own house. We put it in a mosquito net. So about 24 of them, I want to give it to the recycling company because I don't have the machines to recycle them. So when I collect them, I ask, I ask the children and the women to pick them for me. But I'm looking for a company that those who recycle to give it to them as sales to also get something to give it to the women so that they will continue picking the plastic for me. So I wanted to use the opportunity to ask if maybe you know any of company like that. Hello. Yeah. Okay. So, Francis, thank you very much for for this um Otuo, um Emmanuel Ameyao. Yes, with with his question. Um, can any of you come in for him? Yeah. Um, this I, I'm I, not done. It's not with the last. Okay. You finish. Okay. Uh, the last question is uh the initially one of the speakers said. We should translate this climate change and environmental education into our local languages. Myself and I have one colleague in Abri. We have been doing that. We have been going to the schools in eastern regions here. Because of our resources, we are not able to go further. But we've gone to West African Senior Secondary School in Adenta. And Abri training us, Abri Girls Training College. What do we do is when we go there, we seek permission from the authorities. They give us a date. Then we sit down with their children. We educate them about the environment. I want to use this opportunity to share one, just a short, successful story. A school invited us in Eastern Region, Kufuridia. 
So we did this process education with them that they shouldn't burn them, they shouldn't be throwing them away. And we came back to sit in our own house. So a week later, the authorities called us that what we came to did as bear fruit. One of the children went to the house and the, he started collecting the plastics and told the parents that not to burn them because when they drink the water, they burn the plastic. And he told the reason why they shouldn't burn them. So the father, it was a new thing to the father. So he came to the school and uh, he told the, told the teachers that ah, my, when my son came to home today, he's been uh, putting the plastics together and telling me that I shouldn't burn them. What is happening? And they told uh, the father what we came there to do so we've realized that it's a really positive because when i'm in town even some of the children have been saying oh when i'll buy a school when i'll buy a school so i was interested in localizing this climate change uh, initiative but my question is uh, we have the problems we have the solutions some of us i have a little organization i'm ready to do those things so are there any organizations which are ready to like partner or we can put ourselves together because i'm also from eastern region here for the p i can even write not to speak alone i can even write a p and i'm from the village a typical village so i can go to any part in ghana to do the education in the three language but is there any organization that are doing that these are my questions and suggestions okay so um i think uh, the organizations doing that so Otu is here um ycc that has to do with emmanuel Ameya. so i'll kindly ask all speakers to drop in their contact details so that people from or the audience from today's session can get in touch with them if they need help or any partnership as to how they can go about it Otuo, you wanted to address one issue of of francis can you go ahead yeah um i Francis, thank you very much. I've also been working in the Eastern region, and then I'm, I'll share my contact in there and my email. You can reach out and we can talk more. So with the plastics, in fact, globally, is it about 40% of plastics that are being recycled? Now, I'm speaking a bit fast because of the time. I want to cut everything short. In Ghana here, we are doing less than 25%, but it's only a part of them that, can, that are mostly recycled. Um, the pet type. So there are different types of plastics. I can't go into it because of time. And then today, we are not doing more of plastics. But then you have to look out for the, in the Eastern region, I have I have actually not seen any company or any um, 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 let me say um, SME into that. But in Ashanti region, I have a lot I'm working with. So you can get a PET type. Those are easily recyclable. And then what they can do is that they can grade them, differentiate the colors. They can then take them to Tema. There's a company that buys them and then reuse them. And so yeah, for the plastic and then for the sachet water that we see around too, there are some companies in Kumasi who are reusing them, and some companies in Accra who are actually doing good with them. And so the only thing you need to do, like I said, we need to collaborate. There's supposed to be a network. Koleba Ghana is doing a lot of stuff so far as plastic is concerned. So when you start something in that move, you reach out to them to find out where you can get the support from. Normally, you collect them because you cannot uh, recycle. You only provide a collection point. You collect them, then you give it to these guys who will recycle them at a fee. That will also help you to get some plow back into investing into your community and other stuff like that. And then on the... The, the converting or translating climate information into uh, local languages. There's a project we are currently doing on that. I will share a link to one we did last year um, in the in the in the in the in the chat box. You can look at that. You can always reach out to me. I'm always in for team where collaboration. We have to coordinate and we co communicate. So I'm always in there. And then we can talk more about this thing. So I'll share my contact as well, and we can talk more. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. And um, like I said. Um, Speakers can um, add in the chat box their contact details so that um, people can get in touch with them for more details and um, how to go ahead to create awareness on these environmental crises. So yeah, Emmanuel, do you want to say something? I was just adding up that uh, the YCC we got we've got about uh, 400 a network of about 400 uh, young activists and uh, youth-led groups. Uh, all across the country, like youth-led environmental organizations. And so we can connect him to some of the organizations and then they can partner probably to help in the recycling or they can buy it and then also recycle. So I think that at, at this point, one of the things we are really committed to is partner, partnership because one person cannot do it alone. So 
within the circular economy, somebody's collecting, somebody too is transporting it, other person is buying and doing the recycling. And so it's, it's a good initiative uh, he's doing, uh, Ofosu, Mr. Ofosu, and uh, we'll try and encourage you to link up with the YCC. Uh, we can try and also link you to other organizations who are within your space and your, 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 your plastics will be of great benefit to them. They can buy it and then also uh, continue with the recycling and all that. So yes, just I'll just drop our, my email address. You can also send me an email and then we'll take over from there. Okay, thank you so much, Mr. Ameyo. And Dr. Kodima, your hands are raised, if you can kindly ask a question. Yes, uh, it's, uh, evening or good evening to everyone. Good evening. Yes, uh, I have a quick question, but I will actually say, uh, I've attended so many uh, trainings and workshops on uh, climate change, but this is more of practical and then there's a local based approach, which I'm actually uh, glad you part. Uh, but the question I have is, uh, if my friend uh, Otto talked about uh, collaboration and partnership, here we have different organizations who are into this climate fight. And we also have individual advocates like uh, Emmanuel mentioned. And one of the problems has to do with duplication. And then the wastage in resources. Here we have an organization in the same district, another in the same district, doing the same thing, the same community over and over. So my question is, how can we actually collaborate? How can we actually team up? And how can we harness our resources together and fight one cause? Because we've been talking about all the programs, they will talk about, oh, teamwork, collaboration, teamwork, collaboration, let's collaborate, teamwork. But it's not happening. We have maybe Otto's organization, which is a eco warrior movement. I, Center for Food Security and Environment, fighting the same cause, maybe the same district, but we don't even know we are all in there. So I want to know from the speakers, what's, what's their approach or what would they suggest for we to actually harness our resources together and fight one course, than not to uh, push more on this duplication. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Doc. Um, let me have a quick reaction to this. In fact, that has been the challenge now. We are always reinventing the wheel. That is why there was one of my three Cs. And so what we can do now is, I like the Youth Climate Council. So they are trying to bring all these organizations together. Then there's also an SDG. Um, there is um, this group by Kojo Dems on, an, on SDGs. So depending on the SDGs you're looking at, you form, you join the group, or CSO's um, coalition for SDGs. So it's also there. Though most people are not aware of it, but as, as, as you come on, just that for that, the requirement is a bit high because you, you should have registered because to be able to accept it as you should have registered the organization, you have a, lot, a few things, but that is also there. You can join. Then the Youth Climate Council is there, which actually my organization is part of all these ones. Then there's another one that at the community, um, sorry, the district level, you know, we practice there, the local governance structure. And so at the district level too, you can register you know, EPAs, EPA has only regional offices. So you can register at the district office with your municipal MMDA offices with the welfare, how do they call it? They call it the welfare, whatever, for where NGOs register. Then you let them know that you are into environment and sustainability. They can get you the data of organizations in that. Then you begin to bring them together. I started it, but you know, I'm a bit busy, so I've listed for some group to do it. They can all come together. Then there are networks. In fact, in the Ashanti region, there's something they have. There's something we have as Ashanti Regional Youth Network, where we have a wink, where we have. We, um, so those into environment, you try to mobilize all and then bring them together. Then at the regional level, the EPA is there. So you register with the EPA. Now, when you register with the EPA, they have data of all organizations that are in the environment or the environmental space that do some work. You can pick the data from them, and then if you want to do that, you can reach out to me. I can link you up to. Um, uh, within the, the national EPA director so that we can do that in your region. You give your cover letter if that they need be, so that you can go to the region and get the data and can start mobilizing. But the problem is that when I started doing this and I realized that some we still need to do awareness. People think you want to pick their shine. One, people think you want to lead them. So you are doing that because of power. You want to, you just need power. You just so that you can govern and you can lead them. And the people are a bit, you know, apprehensive when it comes to those things. 
And so we need a little bit of awareness creation. That is why, personally, I'm not leading any of such groups again, but I'm trying to build advocacy that we should be able to learn to coordinate, to collaborate, because teamwork should be uh, situational leadership, where the person with the core competencies at any point in time leads the group to achieve their set purpose. And this is what people should understand. So we should get this one into our people so that they would want to join groups. Because when you join groups, it even gives you a lot of opportunities. Like for instance, right now, the guy was talking about doing some work in the Eastern region. As soon as you get into Youth Climate Council, we are linking you up and that is what we want. And so, yes, we are doing advocacy at this level. And then I've given these structures we can also use to get ourselves embedded in the greater body of the people working in the environmental space. I don't know if I've been able to help, but this is a little I can do. We can keep talking more on that. Thank you. I, I want to add up. Thank you. I want to add up to what uh, I know to said. In terms of, uh, the, there are a lot of vested interests, but if you look across the country, there are a lot of young people doing amazing stuff all over the country, but we need a common voice and a common platform. One of the things I've, I've, I realized in my practice as a journalist, and again, moving into advocacy is that government and the key stakeholders would only want to engage you if you have the numbers. Now, you as a single entity, you go to engage EPA or MESTI, and then they would bring this letter, bring that. And so when we had a conversation with the ministry and then EPA, they told us that, you know what, we need a unified front where all a, a, a council which all youth led or any environmental organization is part of. And then we can tap into that. So let's say for ICC, we have about 400 uh, members uh, across individuals and then uh, organizations. And we've categorized each person into each uh, person into their interest. So there are people who have interest in open knowledge, uh, comms, uh, communication, there are people with renewable energy, people plastic uh, recycling and all that. And so once uh, the, the ministry or any agency links up with the YCC, like, okay, you know what, we want uh, uh, organizations that are working within the space of uh, recycle, plastic recycle. Quickly, we can touch base with Polybar or this. We send an open application that, you know what, this is the chance that they want five people within this space. And then we, we do what, we link up with them and we create that facilitation rule. If uh, uh, times there's a lot of competition within the space. People just like, you know, people want the, uh, the shine, people want to lead, but we are all having a common interest in protecting the environment. So for why is it like this? We are not trying to fight or being in competition with anybody. Since we started, we've, we've always shared uh, resources, tools. We do a lot of workshops. We do, we do a lot of workshops that are uh, uh, knowledge. We did a comms workshop. We did one for journalists. We are doing one in Kumasi as well. We had the advocacy seed funding initiative, which was supported by UNICEF. UNICEF thought that it is a great idea to have a council which, which comprises of all youth-led organizations as far as environment and climate change is concerned. We continue to share travel opportunities, conferences, workshops, there are tools and resources as well. We, we, we want to do this to enhance and build capacity for all activists across the country. We believe that this fight is not something that only one person can do. Everybody must play a role and we must see each other as partners not competitors. If you help me, I help you. We drag each other together. And so for me, your question is very valid, but again, I will encourage you that I'm not that trying to market the YCC, but again, I'm trying to encourage you that you join the YCC. There's a lot of opportunities out there. We can link you to other people. I mean, we have uh, the voter region. We have regional focal point all across the country. And the organization you mentioned, West Africa, I think there's a, a lady called Lydia. Uh, she's also part of our Lydia Kokokwaku. I think she's part of us and she works with us on, on, on the other secretariat. So um, let's see how we can partner. It's very important that we foster that partnership because there are times where you would need funding. There are times where you would need support in certain ways. There are times that you need even the human resource. And all these things, you can tap into that. We will give you people who are competent and would help you enhance your work at the various communities. And so I think that uh, let's see how uh, it, it Thank goes. Thank you very yes, much. Yes. Thank you very much, um, Mr. Emmanuel Ameyal. Thank you um, to everyone for your time, your patience, and 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 yes, <laughs> for using your support. This this um. Okay, so I want to use to thank everyone you, especially our speakers and the 
overall of it goes to our audience for your patience once again. Thank you. Okay, thank you. The session has been very educative because today we have known how um, open knowledge can help us in creating the awareness and making known to people um, what is at stake and what we, we will lose if we do not rise up urgently um, for a lot of things to be addressed. So thank you once again for everything once again. And I want to bring the event to an end. Thank you. My name is Crystal Olami and I'm the Programs Officer for Open Foundation West Africa. Thank you. Um, have a nice and enjoy the rest of your day, I must say. <laughs>